This is new content. Um, it's pretty much the first time I've presented it. I, wrote, I was working on my slides yesterday. And this is really the first of an installment of things. So I'm setting out the groundwork for some work I'm expecting to do a lot more on in 2020. Uh, and first I want to start with like, why, why do I care about this? And this is what's really happening. Um, I'm starting to see more of AWS customers not just move like the front end or the back end for a mobile app or something like that to the cloud. They're closing all their data centers. They're moving everything to the cloud. This includes airlines. I want aircraft. Yeah, I'm a power user of airlines. I want all the airlines that can keep flying. Um, finance, healthcare, manufacturing. We have substantial businesses that are moving their critical infrastructure and they're moving that to the cloud. So as they do that, we've got to develop the patterns that make that work reliably, and we've got to understand the failure modes, and we've got to have a much more sophisticated discussion about what could go wrong and what to do. So that's why I'm, why I'm sort of poking at this, and if anyone wants to talk about that, if you're in a safety-critical industry, very happy to continue the conversation. So in the past, we had disaster recovery. Back in the 70s, this started. You had a mainframe over here, and you could have another mainframe over there, and you'd copy stuff back and forward, and if something went wrong, you could switch to the other one. That was sort of the traditional disaster recovery model. That then became more institutionalized in that, well, I have a backup data center. I'll talk a bit more about that later. Then, um, I guess, you know, between Amazon and Netflix and a few other people, we came up with chaos engineering a decade or so ago. And we were starting to induce failure. The, the difference in chaos engineering is it's API driven. Everything was highly automated. So we could start using automation to do some of the disaster recovery and do it a little bit more proactively. But what I think we're heading towards is continuous resilience. And you know, I have this sort of question. Like, if, nobody seems to want chaos in production, right? So do you want chaos in production? So if I call it continuous resilience, will you let me do it in production? <laughs> I'm just changing, really, it's really just changing the name, right? It's we're doing exactly the same thing. But when we're doing it in production, we'll be doing continuous resilience, because I think that's easier to sell to management, because nobody doesn't want continuous resilience. But they're not sure about anything with the word chaos in it. So there's a bit of a branding thing here, but you know. This, the, what I'm really talking about here is trying to productize and automate the things that the sort of unicorn companies have done with chaos engineering and take that to be a common pattern that's more productized that we'll be able to use across the industry as sort of building blocks. So that's, we're in that transition right now. So here's, here's the real problem. You can only be as strong as your weakest link. Right? It, it, whether it's security or availability, and, you know, that one chink in your armor is the thing that will break. And the only way you can find that chink is by having somebody go there and test every link to find where the weaknesses are. So, and this really doesn't just apply to availability. It applies to safety and security. They all have similar characteristics. If you think about it, they have hard to measure near misses because you don't see the near misses. They're sort of invisible, but they're the ones you need to watch out for. They have complex dependencies that are hard to model. And then they have catastrophic failure modes. When it goes wrong, it really goes wrong, right? Um, and we get, we get stories almost every day, something went wrong, ran out of capacity at launch, um, or there's a you know, failure, a security failure, or an outage, or something like that. But they also have similar mitigations. And the way you protect against all these things is to have some kind of layered defense in depth. So if, something, if one thing breaks, there's another thing behind it to save you. And behind that, maybe there's another thing. Depending on, on how critical it is, there's layers of defense. That applies to security, availability, safety. They're all the same. There's bulkheads. So if something goes wrong, you want to contain it. You want to stop it from spreading beyond that. And that's one of the reasons that microservices work. So if a microservice crash, it doesn't crash everything. Like if a, if a monolith crashes, the whole thing's gone, right? So that's, that bulkhead is, is part of it. And you really want to minimize dependencies and privilege. So if you look, think about a, a monolith that touches credit cards, the whole monolith has to be PCI compliant and is subject to all these controls. If you have a set of microservices, the ones that touch credit cards probably in a different account manage very differently than the ones doing personalization or the ones you know, choosing what color the screen should be or whatever, the, the, the user interface. So you can iterate and go much faster and have much lighter weight controls on the, the parts of your system 
that have minimum privilege and dependencies, and you can really concentrate on the pieces that, are, that, that need it. So that's another reason for spreading apart things and not bundling everything into one big monolith. But they also break each other. You know, how many times has a security failure taken down your system? In fact, if, you, if there's a breach going on, the first thing they do is shut everything down so you're not available, right? That's, that's one of the things. And then the other thing is, if a system that's managing safety crashes, you don't have the safety, right? I mean, if your self-driving car controller crashes, you might drive you off a cliff or something. You, know, you don't want these things to happen. So these things are all linked across, and we can think about all the different linkages. So, but what I'm going to concentrate on today is the availability piece. And I'm sort of, we'll extend this, and some of these techniques can be used for uh, uh, security and safety as well. I'm particularly interested in safety right now, in safety critical industries. So, what should you do, what should your system do when something fails? So what does your system do, right? I mean, you can, a few choices. One of the things you can do is stop, because you're not sure what you should do. If it might not be safe to continue, so you should stop. The other thing is maybe try and carry on with reduced functionality. So that sounds, sounds nice. So what actually usually happens? It collapses horribly. Because <laughs> the least well-tested code in your system is the error handling code. And the least well-tested processes you have are the disaster recovery processes. Right? It's just the fact of life. These things are the ones that no one wants to touch, because if anything goes wrong, then it makes it even worse. And, and we've got lots of examples of a small failure causing triggering a bigger failure and it blowing up to take out an entire system, an entire company. We've seen like airports and airlines go down because of a single router or a single power supply kind of failure um, or a small error in one place, right? Or nu nuclear power station uh, failures, those kinds of things. So think about this, think about a permissions lookup. It's a fairly minor thing. Are you running through your code and you say, should this customer be allowed to do this thing? And you get an exception back so you can't tell, right? Because the subscriber service is down. Should you stop or continue? Well, it depends, right? What's, what are you about to do? Are you about to move a billion dollars from one bank account to another? Or are you about to show somebody a movie, <laughs> right? <laughs> If you can show someone a move, just keep going. That was the, we, we eventually sort of trained most of the Netflix engineers to like do permissive failure because the cost of showing them that movie, if you weren't sure if they were actual up, you know, subscriber in good standing, was you know, negligible. Right? It's, it, that's probably not even a cent or something. It's something like that. But if you're in banking and the, you're not quite sure what the state the world is in, you stop. Right? And, and that's the way they operate. There's a really good paper on this. You saw Pat yesterday morning. Uh, he's got lots of great papers. Memory guesses and apologies is, is sort of a little high-level view of what databases are. Databases are things that try to remember what you told them. Then they try to guess what you, what you told them before. And if they can't figure out what to do next, they try to apologize for it. Right? And, and the apologies part is actually the bit that's interesting here. It talks about sometimes, rather than writing a whole lot of code to try and capture every, every condition, you say, like, Call this number. Call custom punting to customer service, punting to a human, is actually one of the best strategies for handling failure modes. Right? So you can overdo it, but, but it's actually better than running through a whole lot of code, which is very poorly tested and probably going to make it worse. Right? So, so this quite often a, the thing to do is like handle the easy stuff, and it gets complicated, punt to a human. And humans have a very adaptable way of being able to manage failure modes. There's a whole section on this. That there's a book called The Accidental Anarchist by um, Sidney Decker, uh, which is really worth reading. Uh, and he talks a lot about how you can't, if you look at the way processes are written and the way the processes are actually operated in safety critical industries, they're different. So if you automate the way it was written down, you're not actually doing the right automation. And the human element is there to make it safe. So who here has a backup data center? A few of you. Who here doesn't like putting their hand up? Okay, all right. Um, some of you put your hand up when you said that. Good. All right. How often do you fail over apps to it? If you work in banking, the answer should be at least once a year because the auditors come by and make you do it, right? If you don't work in banking, the answers are usually never or like or very very occasionally. I did one, have one person who gave the best answer I've ever had, which is every weekend. And if the, 
if, if the weak number is even, we're on this, this data center, and if the weak number is odd, we're running on this data center, we flip it every weekend, and if anything goes wrong on a Wednesday, we push the button, we flip, and everyone carries on, and it's perfect. Right? So that is the best operational discipline I've ever heard of. Uh, it happened once, I've never, in the audience. Um, Netflix is sort of, last time I heard was doing like every couple of weeks they do a sort of a data center, a, a region evacuation kind of test. So they're testing stuff reasonably often. Uh, one of the big uh, banks we were working with did a one-time region evacuation test and uh, there was a lot of work and it went well, but you know, they don't do it every few weeks, right? It's something that, that people do to test. So that's apps, and then the whole data center at once. Does that ever happen? Because typically the auditors make you test your critical apps. They don't pull the plug on the data center. Right? This is very rare. Um, I call this availability theater. You've spent a lot of money building a big data center, and if you ever had to use it, you know that you'd be in terrible shape, and it's horrible, and you know, all kinds of things would go wrong. So the only time you actually test data center failure is when it actually fails, and that's when you discover how little of it actually works. So we have this nice fairy tale we're operating on, once upon a time in theory. If everything works perfectly, we've got a plan to survive some of the disasters we thought of in advance. Um, it's not a great story, not a good bedtime story. It'll keep you up at night. Um, so here's a few things. Think about your company's domain name. Think about what happened if that domain name no longer existed or you know, was taken down because somebody forgot to renew it, right? How much of your systems would work? Turns out there was a SaaS provider who ha this happened to a few, couple of years ago. Um, so all of their internal email was down. So it means all of the accounts they had to do anything were on that email address. Um, all of their product was on the same domain. Like, so the, what was left? What, Twitter handle. <laughs> CEO apologizing on Twitter for about two days, solid. Like, all he could do is like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we're trying to fix it, right? That was the only communication channel they had left that was branded to that vendor, right? So don't be that company. Like everyone hopefully is being frightened now. DNS is the fastest way of taking down just about any service. Right? We'll look a bit at that later. Um, this has happened to everybody in the room, I pretty much, that's been running anything. I'm just guaranteeing that you have had a certificate site. This happened like it took down Netflix a bunch of times. It's happened to AWS. We have so much process around trying to find these stupid certificates and make sure they don't all expire at the same time and have tracking systems for them. And the operational effort gone into just this one thing is huge. And we're, we're pretty good at it. And every now and again, we, some new service comes up and they manage to sneak another one in. And, you know. But the mature ones are pretty good at this. So that happens all the time. Um, turns out computers don't work underwater. It's very sad, really. Uh, and then when the water goes away, they're full of bits of sand and seaweed and dead fish and things. They still don't work. Um, and a friend of mine had a lovely time rebuilding a data center that was no longer in a basement in Jersey City. Um, another trick, don't put the generators in the basement. <laughs> That's also not a good plan. Um, and not putting the, the fuel supply for the generators in the basement is also not a good plan. It's like try to keep stuff above flood level if possible. Um, and hopefully not you tomorrow. Um, so watch out for that. So there's a, a good book here, Drift Into Failure. This, the point of this book is that you can have, at every stage, you're making the right decision, you're doing the right thing. It actually isn't good to test your backup systems because you know they're not going to work and it's going to be expensive and, and it might not go wrong. So the locally right thing to do is to just concentrate on making your product better and hope that you don't get the failure. Right? That is actually the rational thing to do. And these rational decisions get put into a chain until every possible mitigation has gone away and then you do get this massive failure. And the book, I tell people don't read the book on a plane because it's mostly full of plane crashes and people dying in hospital <laughs> and stuff like that. And then uh, if you want to see the, uh, like the entire chapter of this book, Tim Dunn's talk, while I was flying to Chicago for Go To Chicago a year or so ago, I, I wrote an entire like, section of this book about a plane crash while I was on a plane and I made myself do it and then gave this talk about um, plane crashes and had to, think, had to learn about that kind of failure. Anyway, um, but what you need to do is learn to capture 
and learn from near misses. The airline industry is very good at this. Every time you get stuck at the gate because one tiny thing was wrong with your plane, that tiny thing is being logged centrally, shared with every airline, shared with every manufacturer. They all share the engines, they share the airframes. All of that information goes into a central database that is managed for the safety of the airline industry. And this is one reason that you know, putting ourselves in metal tubes and shooting ourselves across continents, is that, which is one of the scariest things we should probably ever think about doing, is actually very safe. Right? It's because it's so dangerous that they got very good at making it safe. So that, that's why I think about it. When things aren't that dangerous, you don't spend so much effort on it. So this is kind of the architecture I think about. You've got infrastructure at the bottom. You've got to have redundancy there. There's some switching between things. So if you've got two ways to do something, you have to have a way to decide one of them isn't working and switch to the other. That switch has to be really robust and reliable. That's the problem with disaster recovery. You're switching processes and code and practices are, the, are not well tested. So you've got an unreliable switch between a, your primary and backup data center. You may as well just not have the backup data center. Above that, you've got the application. You know, make sure your code doesn't fall over when it gets uh, annoying error messages and things. Um, and then at the top, you've got people, because given a perfectly good system, people will mess it up. Right? If you're not trained, you don't know what it's doing, you'll reboot the wrong machine. Um, you'll, you know, you're not practiced. So you need, you need game days and you need to practice the exercises that will let you know what to do when there's a failure. So this is kind of the defense in depth for availability. You need experienced staff that have been on calls. They know how to handle the main failure modes. You've got robust applications that you've done a bit of fuzz testing and you've tried to break a few times. You've got a dependable switching fabric and there's a redundant service foundation. So this, that, this part of the talk I've given a few times. It's sort of an intro to, to sort of why this is interesting. I'm not going to go off into uh, something that I haven't really, this is kind of the first time I've presented it. Um, and just sort of bridging into it. One of the things about failures is that as you get good at handling them, you start to get, they start to become more and more strange. Like the easy ones, you sort it. And then the, every error you get is one something you've never seen before. It's some weird combination of things. So what you end up, the best defense is get fast at figuring it out. And I, did, I did a talk about five years ago at Monitorama where I was complaining about the fact that a lot of monitoring tools do one minute, gather data every minute, and then they actually sit on the data for a few minutes and sort of about you know, six, seven minutes after something actually happened in the real world, you finally have enough points on a graph to say, oh, that doesn't look good. Right? And then you try to fix it, and then you have to wait another six or seven minutes before the graph gets better again. Right? So you know, minutes is maybe fine, but at the kind of rate we're running at with online web services, that could be too long. Right? And it's very hard. So this is, the feedback loop is too slow. So if you have one second updates for some of your critical measures, then you know, within 30 seconds you can tell something's gone wrong. So one of the kind of effects here is like you deploy some code, and you go, I can't even tell whether this is good or not for five minutes, I'm gonna go get a cup of coffee. So you're off by the coffee and everyone starts running around because the site's down, and what's going on? And eventually you wander back and discover you broke the site and you were off chatting to people over a cup of coffee, right? If you know you're gonna be able to see it in 30 seconds, you'll wait to make sure it's okay before you go and get the cup of coffee. There's something about a 30 seconds is sort of the limit. 10 seconds is great for responsiveness and like 30 seconds is sort of the maximum. And after that, you're gonna be off doing something else. So sort of human attention span is an important characteristic of these safety systems. So what we wanna do then is make it possible to see what's going on. And observability is a very important characteristic. And, and the word observability was really defined in this paper uh, in 1961. Uh, by Kalman, who did a lot of work in control theory. So if you can tell how a system's going to behave by looking at its inputs and outputs, then it's observable. That's actually a, a strong property of a control system. What that means is that if it's doing something inside, you have to have a way to look inside it and do logging or expose some of the internal behaviors so that you can predict what its output's going to be. So that's really what we're doing. Adding logging to a system is just making it more observable. Sticking printfs in your code, that's observability, right? All these things are models, though. What you have outside the system is a model of how you think it's going to behave. 
and all models are wrong, some models are useful. The, the key here is to have one that's simple enough that it's tractable to work with, but complicated enough that it captures the behavior of the system. So this, this book is probably the most interesting book right now. There's, they run um, workshops. There's a workshop next March. I've actually applied to go to it. I want to go hang out with uh, Nancy Leveson and the team at MIT. Um, I, I'm really into systems thinking in general. I've done talks on that. But using systems thinking to look at safety, um, there's a lot of interesting work here. So the systems that are described in this book, a couple of fairly insignificant systems like the air traffic control system, uh, the nuclear launch system, they worked, this is the team that worked on making those, you know, not crash planes into each other and not have accidentally launched nuclear missiles all the time, that kind of thing. So the software in those systems needs to be done right. And, and this is, there's a lot of uh, examples in there. So I'm going to dig into this a little bit and try and explain how this works. This is a screenshot from the book. And it's got three levels in it. If you look at this, the, at the bottom's the control process. That's the, thing you, that's the thing that does the work. Above it, you've got the automated controller. And a lot of the code we write is actually controlling things, right? It's controlling the process. Like, think of you know, autoscalers or a lot of the security code, like, it's permission checking, like, should you do this thing, right? All of that is control process. And above that is a human, and the human's trying to understand, is the automatic control working right, and is the thing itself working right? Make sense? So I'm going to add, change the labels on this to maybe make it make more sense. So here's a financial services application at the bottom. Customers are making requests to it. At some point, it says, OK, whatever you've requested has some completed action. It's just some part of the flow of some financial services application. Above that, there's a control plane, which is maybe auto-scaling the number of machines that are running it, or it's acting, uh, doing fraud analysis to decide whether the system should be allowed to do things or something like that. So you've got all these controls that you've put around your code. And above it, there's a human watching this. If the human sees throughput go to zero, they're supposed to pay attention and go, hey, what happened? Maybe there's an alert gets sent to them, and they say, okay, how do I, is the control plane telling me the wrong thing? Is the metric telling me the wrong thing? Or is it really gone to zero, right? You don't know. So that's your model of automation is your model of how that control plane is working. And the model of control process is your understanding of how the actual thing works. So if you imagine getting somebody that's never seen the system before and putting them in charge of it and they get the alert, they don't have the model, right? And, they, and you're saying, well, what should you do? I don't know, call someone, call a, you know, phone a friend, something like that, right? You have to, training, this written trained procedures is about trying to get people to understand the model of behavior of the control system and the model of the thing being controlled. There's two separate models. And a lot of the problems we have are in the usability of, these, uh, of, of that interface. So this is, this is the way STPA works. You, you, instead of looking at the boxes and saying, what could go wrong with this box, we look at the wires. We look at the connections between them. We look at the information flows. So in this case, let's say the human controller sees throughput go to zero. Uh, well, the throughput goes to zero, and the human is supposed to generate a control action. But the human was, like, there's all these different things. Human was not paying attention. So not provided. They didn't do the action. So maybe the system to run, runs out for a while. Or they do an unsafe action, like rebooting everything in sight, maybe. Um, they, the system was actually running fine, but they got freaked out by something and did something that wasn't necessary. Like maybe the reason that the throughput went down was that you know, the Super Bowl just started on TV, which is something that causes about half of Netflix's traffic to go away when I was there. That was sort of, in fact, we had a big outage once in Brazil and Mexico at the same time, because Brazil and Mexico were playing each other at soccer. And everyone stopped all the TVs with a bigger DOS attack on all the people trying to watch Netflix on TV. Anyway, um, so there are external reasons why throughput might drop. And you might get freaked out and do something that isn't needed. So that's an unsafe action or safe but too early. And then you might say, oh, this is, you know, the system's down. You, you provide the right action, but too late. You could do things in the wrong order. Um, you could improve, say, maybe you want to, you, you see throughput go up and the system sort of getting unhappy. And you want to increase the limit on an autoscaler, but you don't increase it enough. That's a sort of a stop too soon. You didn't, you didn't provide enough of a fix. Um, 
or you took too long, then there's conflicts. Like maybe there isn't one human controller, there's a room full of them and they can't agree what to do, right? That kind of conflict, coordination problems between people. Maybe two people independently fix the system without talking to each other and the combination of the two break things, right? Or it degrades over time meaning the, maybe the written procedure about how to fix this particular problem was written years ago and the system's changed enough that it no longer reflects that system. So, so these are, this is a good checklist for hazards. If you're looking at how to control your environment and you're looking at that human interface, you know, these, these, these are the standard list of hazards. You go through, go through them one by one, think about how would this apply to my system. You've got, you can go through and you can make a list and think, well, what would, what would we do here? How are we gonna make sure only one person at a time is making a change? Well, get everybody on a con call and have that coordination happen on the con call. That, that, you can't make a change unless you're dialed into the call. Those kinds of rules are, are there to, to give that coordination, right? But you've got to follow them. Here's another area. What if the system just for some reason stops reporting the right numbers, right? It's working fine, it's completing its actions, but it stopped reporting throughput, you know? So you don't know, what, so what happens? Maybe you, maybe you just, it gets frozen at the last number, so you just stop getting updates. Maybe you start getting zeros. Maybe the number overflows and you're getting sort of effectively random numbers or negative numbers for throughput. Or it's corrupted, there's some bit error somewhere in the, along the way and some random number comes through. Um, and that might trigger an alarm. Um, if particularly if you've got a control algorithm that is automatically applying things, if you feed a random number into it, you're gonna get weird stuff, right? So you gotta be careful what those control algorithms are doing. Uh, out of order, sometimes things get delivered in, in the wrong order. They, something gets delayed, something else gets past it, you can get issues with that. Um, maybe the system just starts sending things too quickly and your sensor, your reporting system, your, your monitoring system collapses under the load. Uh, that can happen a lot in a fast-growing business. Um, or it just gets delayed, like I was pointing out before. If it takes eight minutes to notice something has gone wrong, that may be too long. And again, coordination problems, and it may get bad over time. Say you've got a memory leak in whatever is recording your sensors or a garbage collection, and after a while, you know, the GCs, pauses start, start getting too slow and the system starts getting unreliable or it's fine when you first deploy it, it gets bad over time. So again, run through this list, try to figure it out. Go read the book, there's a lot more detail on how to do this. I'm just trying to give you a flavor for this mechanism because the thing about this, I'm not saying did the app fail, I'm thinking about am I providing the right information to the other parts of the system and what could go wrong with that information? So it's, it's looking at the wires rather than the boxes in the diagram, right? Another problem, model problems, right? So my model of automation, I wasn't trained in how the system worked. Um, so I have the wrong model. I think the system behaves in a certain way and it actually behaves in a different way. Or I don't have the right inputs. Like the system isn't actually out of CPU, it's out of memory, but I have no data on the memory usage. Um, I'm not getting updates, the similar kind of issues, right? But you can have a problem with the model in the human or the model in the control plane as well, right? So think about what could go wrong there. And here's a particular example of that. You know, the Boeing 737 MAX 8, well-known problem right now. The model of automation that was in the pilot's head had not been updated from the previous 737. This is one part of what went wrong. So when the plane started nosediving, they didn't know why, right? And they couldn't understand that the anti-stall system, which, they didn't, which was a new system, had a model of a control process and it, was, and it was automating something. It was trying to manage the system but their model of the automation had not been updated, right? That is one reason why those, I mean, there's obviously other reasons, but that was sort of one of the big contributing reasons that they wanted to make the plane as similar as possible to the last one, so they didn't want to retrain everybody to make it cheaper to introduce, but you know, there was a critical piece of training here for a system that turned out to, to uh, crash, out, crash the systems. <clears throat> So that's, that's STPA, and, and I think it's a really interesting way of looking at what goes wrong. And it's very good at the operator interaction and thinking about the overall control stability. So it's a top-down method. You're looking at the system from above, you're working down. I'm going to be developing more models on that in future versions of this talk. We're now going to sort of do more of a bottom-up version, looking at risk. If we look at risk, typically, you know, financial risk, it's usually severity and probability. What's the probability of something going wrong 
and how bad would it be, right? Multiply those two together, you've got some idea of risk. And this is economic financial risks are usually thought about in this way. However, if you add engineering risk, detectability matters. Right? And this is because, you know, if a plane crashes, you kind of know the plane crashed, but that's a big thing. Like, if you lose money, you can count the money, right? But uh, if there's some weird thing happening deep in something and you can't see it, you're building up failures and you're building up risk that you can't see. So one way to mitigate risk is to add observability to expose silent failures. It actually reduces the risk because you can tell they aren't happening and you can tell they're starting to happen and you can get in there and mitigate something before it actually takes you out. And this is component level, and there's a bunch of prioritization you can, you can do here to basically figure out what's the highest risk you should work on. So FMEA is a technique invented in the 1960s or so. It's an old engineering technique. Anyone who did mechanical engineering or electrical engineering, they taught it to in college. They don't seem to teach it to software developers, but yeah, it's a, I, I think it's a useful technique because it gives you a way to prioritize and list what you're doing and discuss things. So I'm going to go through some FMEAs now. And I think there's, the way I'm layering this is four different FMEAs. There are four different groups of people that should get together to think about what could go wrong. The people that write the unique code for whatever business you're in, the unique business logic. Product managers need to be in the conversation because a lot of the what goes wrong touches customers and the behavior of the system, right? And then developers that are writing that code. So that unique business logic is a layer that you want to think about just in, in isolation. Underneath that, what I'm calling the software platform team is all the code you got from somewhere else that you didn't write, what could go wrong with that? Some of that code is libraries, some of it's you know, running systems, commercial off the shelf software that you've installed, it's cloud web services, all of that stuff that you depend on, what could go wrong with that? So that includes things like uh, cloud control planes and things like that, you know, those, those sorts of services. Underneath that, infrastructure, this is what I mean here is hardware, like networks, buildings, machines, those kinds of failures, power, and, and all those sorts of stuff. And finally, resilience engineering. Things can go wrong with the teams that are trying to manage the processes of failure, like not knowing where the, which phone number you're supposed to call into when there's, a, when there's an incident, or not knowing how to log into dashboards, or having a monitoring system that fails along with the system. So there's failures of observability, which can actually leave you blind, and that's a whole different set of failure modes, and whoever's managing that should go and figure out what could go wrong, right? Um, I've, I've got, Sample versions of these spreadsheets, uh, I put stuff on my GitHub account. I put slides on GitHub. I put PowerPoint in GitHub I'm in this vague thought that one day Microsoft might let me do a pull request against an individual slide in a PowerPoint, but um, since they own this thing now. Anyway, it's a theory. I keep mentioning that, and maybe one day they'll, they'll integrate that. Um, but anyway, there's a bunch of uh, my slides. This deck isn't up there because I'm still kind of working on it. Um, so if we look at... FMEA, there are severity levels, and we do a ranking of one to 10. So if we look at, I modified this a bit for infrastructure. So the, the, the effects on the left are the standard name. So what does this mean? Hazardous without warning, what does that mean? It means an earthquake or a meteorite destroyed your whole building. Like no warning, people injured. So no warning, right? What could, what could take you out with no warning? Like, Earthquakes and meteorites you don't get much warning. The next level down, you get a couple of days warning because you, you, you know, they knew that thing was Hurricane Sandy was coming for several days, right? You have time to do something to the system, but it still could destroy everything. The next one up is now floods. Um, you can the building is sort of okay, but the stuff in it's busted. And then if you have a fire, you get sort of partial failures. The fire suppression system will take it out. You probably still have some of your, your data, but you lost some. So the ones I put in red are where you've got some permanent loss of information. Like you lost some capacity or you lost some data. Right? It's not coming back. Those machines are dead. Those disks are dead. The yellow ones are temporary. It's down, but if you put power or cooling back, it's going to come back. And you know, there's various levels of failure mode there. Right? There's sort of a bit on the bubble here where quite often if you, pounce, if you power cycle a machine, they don't all come back. Like not every disk starts back up, not every machine starts back up. Sometimes that disruption of power cycling can
trigger or latent faults in machines. So there's a bit of bit on the bubble there. But the sort of the way of thinking about it, right? People say, well, the, some, something, you know, data center went down. Do you mean, it, is it ever going to come back? Is very different, right? If it's a smoking hole in the ground, that's a different outage than it just lost power for a few hours, right? <clears throat> then we have some standard sort of probability things. This is a, just a standard set, and the idea is sort of an exponential idea that, you know, how, how likely is this thing to happen? And you, you sort of guess something in this level. The idea here is to be sort of relative. It's not, you're not trying to be very accurate. You're just trying to get a relative probability. And then likelihood. This is how well you can detect it. Like, if you have no way of, of measuring this thing, you have to give it a high, a high uh, ranking for unlikely to detect. If, you've got, if you can probably see it, you're in the middle. And if you've got really good monitoring, observability, alerts set up, and people pay attention to the alerts, you'll be down at the bottom there. So you're trying to just sort of, it's, don't get too hung up on picking the number, it's just trying to get a number. <clears throat> so let's look at an example. What could go wrong with this? Well, you could say, look up, and then no response. Okay, DNS is down, right? So that's one thing that could go wrong with getting with, with, with a system. I got my mobile app and, you know, whatever, this is that, you know, um, I forgot to renew my domain or something, right? Let's look at another one. Let's assume we've managed to look it up. So we're going to send it a request, and it immediately says no route to that. You get an immediate, this is a fast fail. If there's no route to host, it comes back immediately. It says, no, I, you give me this IP address, I, there's, no one, there's no one at home, right? Maybe the service is down, you know, whatever. That there's something going wrong here, but uh, there isn't a route. So the network routing is down. So this is a, a fast fail. And fast fails are nice because you can track them quickly. Um, connect to host. No, hang around, wait a bit. Takes a little while. Okay. Undeliverable. But it timed out getting there, right? So you have to wait tens of seconds or something before you get a request back. So this is another failure mode, right? So this is just uh, your little... Every microservice that calls every mi other microservice, you can get these kinds of failures in them. So this is kind of looking at that low-level thing. So looking at the protocol as a series of failure modes. Here's another one, connect. Uh, let's try again. <laughs> OK, it kind of worked in the end, but you're kind of logging something about some timeout, maybe. If you can measure the timeout, maybe you log that. All right. So. This is what that looks like in an FMEA, right? So what I've got here is I'm trying to call an API endpoint. And these are those four situations I just ran through, but set out in a spreadsheet where we says, you know, service unknown, service unreachable, uh, request undeliverable, delivered but no response, right? And you've got all these different things here. And I've, I've made up some numbers for what I think the various um, severity is the first column. Uh, probability is the next one, and uh, detectability is the third one. And you multiply them together, so 5 times 1 times 10 is 50, because I have no way to know. So if DNS is down, nothing can get to your site. In fact, no one, your site will just be coming, it's fine. If DNS is down for some proportion of your customers, it's an invisible failure. The only way you find out is when customers start tweeting or phoning your support line. And I've had that, I've seen that failure a few times. It's very hard to detect. So. What, how do you work around it? Maybe you use an endpoint monitor, like those DNS endpoint monitors. There's a number of ways you could try and catch that. But uh, I think people in general underestimate the number of ways DNS can take you out. And it's, it's an area people should put more effort into. So I cut quite a high score of 50 on that. And the other ones are pretty unlikely and not going to be that much of a problem. But um, you can sort of retry things. So. Let's assume we actually managed to get the... So that previous one was sort of TCP level, like, like can I get a packet there, right? So let's pop up a level and uh, look at some authentication. Hey, I'm this user. Nah, don't care. <laughs> Not going to talk to you. Um, and we're going to log that, you know, it took a certain amount of time to say this user failed to authenticate for some reason. So here's, here's how you do that as an FMEA. And a couple of, either it fails completely or it's slow and unreliable. There's sort of two different cases. Um, and, you know, they're reasonably high. You should probably make sure you log an alert and have some way of, of tracking these things. You see what I mean? So you can kind of work through 
at one level. So this is now authenticating. So once I get through this, I now have a connection that's authenticated I can actually send a request on. <clears throat> so finally, I can say, hey, get my home page. <laughs> Uh, so, I don't know, all kinds of things could come back here. So think about the things that could come back. Um, think about you should log them, you should log how long they take, what you were doing, what, what went wrong. Right? So quite often the logging doesn't have all the information you'd want. Um, and here's a few uh, example things that might go wrong. Um, like time bombs. So things that die, die over time, like internal wraparound, memory leaks, um, Everyone here should be subscribed to the end of Unix time. If you're on Facebook, there's an event you can subscribe to. It's 2038. It's when the uh, uh, number of seconds since 1970 goes negative as a 32-bit number. Um, and that's Unix time. So it's, uh, we, you can just subscribe to it, and then we'll all have a little party or something. Um, <laughs> so how, many, how many is that? 20 years? 19 years. All right, another 19 years. QCon 2038. We'll, we'll all get together. and get it on our Zimmer frames and whatever, some of us. Anyway, um, date bombs, leap years, leap seconds, epochs wrapping around Y2K. You know, are you testing for those? How do those break your system? You know, th th this is the kind of stuff that could cause you to get a different response back. Content bombs, um, incoming data that crashes the app. Uh, I have a few examples of that. I'm just going to skip there. You want to fuzz the input. You want to generate random things to see if you can crash things, right? Um, Config errors, versioning errors, retry storms. I have a whole talk on retry storms I used to give. But um, some of these, this is where chaos testing at the application level works, where you sort of get your copy of Gremlin and you sort of try to break one microservice at a time, or you get in there and just mess with it, right? So microservice level, you should be able to, because the nice thing about microservice does one thing. Hopefully you did it this way. You, it has one verb or one noun that implements. You ask it to do the thing, and it either does it or doesn't do it. And you should be able to see if it, how fast it does it, and, and poke at it. So that that isolation of, of functionality makes microservices much more tractable for knowing how they behave under failure. When you have a monolith that does a hundred different things, there's so much internal state and complexity. It's very hard to understand to get good test coverage on it. But what I'm focusing on here is sort of the interactions between the microservices and what can go wrong there and how those would propagate. So popping down a level, if we look at, um, for example, the service, you know, the, the, it's a cloud service control plane. So what could go wrong here? It says, I, you, you're making a call to EC2. It says, give me an instance. And it says, no. <laughs> oh, that's bad. Um, why? Well, we don't have any more of those left is one answer. Um, we try not to do that too often. Or maybe the control plane's down or something's wrong. Something's unhappy with, with the system today. Um, so you try calling to say, can I have an increased limit, draw a different instance type, or switch to a different zone or a different region, right? So that's the provisioning part of EC2. Um, there's a bunch of other things that could happen. You could get one, but it doesn't start, or it could just take a long time to start. So there's a number of, you could think about what would you do in your situation. Similarly on the networking, networking, one of the availability uh, patterns that works well is to pre-allocate. If you're doing multi-regions, pre-allocate all the networking so that if, if you're in the middle of some outage handling, your networking is already there. The cost of the networking structures is very low. You should make sure that they are always set up everywhere you want to be, even if you're not currently using them. Right? It's a good practice. So that's that pre-allocate uh, network structures in all regions. Right? Uh, and maybe a database you're trying to, like, you know, there's something that you can't increase the table sizes, all these kinds of things. So you want to basically try to pre-allocate state um, in, so that your control plane isn't needed as much. So if, you're do, if your systems are there and you can just send traffic to a backup system, if you're doing a failover, that's nice. Uh, as long as you don't have to provision new stuff, that will be easier, right? So there's a number of failures here where you can mitigate them by pre-allocating. That's the point, really. And if we look at the infrastructure level, I talked about this a minute ago, like availability zone durability. Permanent destruction of a zone, fire or flood, you really want to make sure the system can run on two out of three zones in a region. And the zones AWS has are at least 10 kilometers apart. They're not in the same flood plane. They're not in the same power supply. They're not on the same network interfaces. They, they, they have as little as possible in common. Um, and then our regions are typically you know, states apart. You know, cross-country or in different countries, so you get a lot more separation there. 
And then if you're trying to connect across regions, um, then you know, there's a bunch of different things. It's the same kind of setup here in terms of the request types. I'm sort of running through the protocol of like, can I get to it? Can I look it up? Can I get to it? So it's the same set of things, but now we're thinking about it in terms of region connectivity instead of thinking about it at application level. So you know, what can you do if you can't deliver packets to a region? After a while you go, okay, I'm just gonna decide that this region is not behaving and I'm the networking trap, I cannot get to it. The network to a region is down or the network to a zone is down. I find ways of routing around. So you've got to be able to test, block the traffic and show that your system knows how to reroute traffic to another road zone or another region, right? So that's kind of what I'm talking about here. And these are just examples uh, if you can look at the spreadsheet, you can fill them out, put your own things in them, extend them. Um, at the operations level, it's better, I think, to use STPA to look at the monitoring operations sort of failure modes, those hazards. So look at the hazards between the user and what they see and what the monitoring system shows you, what your dashboards show you, and what the system's got. But there are some kind of low-level things like just authentication. Maybe your monitoring agent, you know, cert timed out, so it can't authenticate. Or, it, or the user can't log in or whatever. There's a bunch of failure modes here to, to do with authentication. So I tend to kind of look at authentication. Connectivity is like the TCP level connectivity. Authentication and then more application level at this low level for the, the traffic between systems. Right? That's sort of a pattern to follow to think, have I covered everything that might go wrong? So STPA has this top-down view of control hazards. An FMEA has a bottom-up, lets you prioritize failure modes, and they, they get better coverage with STPA in general for the things that go wrong, particularly for human stuff, but you really want to use both in conjunction. There's, there's good places to use both. Some people get sort of religious about one or the other, but I think there's lots of tools in the toolbox. These are interesting ones that can be useful. Um, so one of the reasons chaos engineering happened when it did is that we had cloud and we were able to automate a lot of stuff. And um, I'm going to go through some resilience practices just to wrap up here. One of them is this rule of three. If there's three ways to succeed, then you're, you're in good shape. You know, if you want to replicate data, three zones in a region, that's what the AWS services do. Uh, if you want to fail over from a primary region to a secondary region, it's actually good to have two different secondary regions because if one failure, failover, fails, you want to have another option to fail over to if you're really paranoid. And then... Workloads across three regions, active, active, active. That's kind of the Netflix pattern that we set up um, back when I was there a long time ago. Um, another thing, if you're failing over, it's good to fail up. So if you're, gonna f if you, if you're worried about having a large workload you know, and you're doing a multi-region um, primary, secondary failover, it's good to fail over from a small region to a big one. Right? And the regions aren't all the same size. Um, you know, there are some workloads which run fine in, in one region, and one of the brand new regions that just came out in some little country around the world, if you fail over to that, you may find it's just like, we don't actually have enough capacity there to run you, right? They, we like to try and make them all look infinite, but they aren't all infinite, and you want to kind of do some capacity planning and estimating. The other thing is, during a failover, there's lots of extra work to do, and that's, if you suddenly discover your application is latency sensitive and stops working when it's further away, that's a really bad time to discover that. So I, you know, the best practice would be, say if, say if you're a Wall Street bank, is to run everything in Oregon and then fail over to uh, Virginia, right, if, if everything goes wrong. That, that's, that you're more likely to succeed that way, right? And if the problem is you're trying to survive a disaster, that, that's a useful attribute. And yeah, then you've got a bit more latency maybe for your daily work. Another thing is to build your resilience environment first. Like the first app that we got running really at Netflix was the Chaos Monkey and everyone else had to put up with the Chaos Monkey because it got there first, right? And we were enforcing uh, order scaling. We want to be able to scale down. If you think of an order scaler scaling up and scaling down, to scale down it has to be able to kill instances. So the Chaos Monkey was there to enforce the ability to scale down horizontally scaled workloads. That was actually what it was for. It was to make sure you didn't put stateful stateful machines, stateful workloads in order scalers. Um, and then you can have this sort of badge of honor kind of gamified a bit. Hey, my app survived all of this chaos testing and is running in this super, super high availability environment and your app didn't. So, you know, do you mean your app's not important? 
you know, you can kind of gamify it a bit. So if we think about continuous delivery, which hopefully many of you are doing now, you need test-driven development, you need canaries. If you put a check in and it flows all the way through to production, you've got that automation, right? Think about continuous resilience as an automated testing environment which will stress test that something really does have all the disaster recovery failover mechanisms in there. So you're not just testing the functionality, you're testing its ability to withstand all of these failover operations. And if you get that in there and do it right, you'll have really, really high confidence that whatever you've got in production is going to be really resilient and um, makes that failure mitigation to a very well-tested co-path. And like I say, I, I don't care if you call it resilience engineering or, or chaos engineering. So as these data centers migrate to the cloud, uh, these fragile manual disaster recovery processes, I think they can be standardized, automated, and we're starting to move to continuous resilience and, and build something that is more of a productizable, repeatable thing. So just running out of time here, but um, there's a paper uh, on, which has a lot more information about how to set up networks and things written by uh, Pawan Anagotri, who's uh, one of the uh, SA managers in the Wall Street region. And I contributed an early version of this uh, material to that paper. So there's a section in there on FMEA. Uh, I, a more de expanded version I posted yesterday on Medium, so you should be able to find this um, long written out version, and there's links to the actual uh, FMEAs, the, the long versions of the FMEAs. So anyway, that, that's what I've got. I'm happy to have this conversation, extend this conversation with people working in safety and, and, um, and mission critical workloads. So thanks very much. <laughs>